Well, why don't we just give a, a warm Highway Church welcome to Pastor Jo as she comes this morning. Awesome. I'm going to get straight into it. I'm looking at our, uh, gospel, the Romans, uh, looking at Romans chapter 8, verse 11. If you've got your Bible, you're welcome to turn with me there or just follow along on the screen. It says this, The Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Whenever we hear uh, in Scripture the Spirit of God, it's talking about the power of God. Can you imagine how much power it took to raise someone who was dead to life? God raised to debt to life a dead person, and then we know that was Jesus. And it wasn't a one-time event. We know that Jesus is still alive today. How about we try that, um, our, our, our statement from before, because I know some of you who've grown up in liturgy or in, um, know how to respond. So are you ready? He is risen. I think we can say that with a bit more joy. You ready? One, two, three. He is risen. Fantastic. So that same power, Scripture tells us, lives in you. Let's keep going. It says, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit within you. He will resurrect the dead parts of your life. He'll resurrect the parts that for you might seem like they have no life in them. Easter is not just a story about one person, Jesus. It is about Jesus and we continue to celebrate him today. But Easter is something that we should remember each week or each, each Easter celebration that knowing that his power can bring to life the things in our life that we've given up on it, that maybe we feel like are lost to us, maybe we feel like that are, um, have, have died, are dead. It wasn't just supposed to be this one-time event that we remember. When you feel like maybe today you're sitting here thinking, oh man, is she reading my mind? How do you know that inside I feel like I'm dying right now? Or there's parts of me in my, in my emotions or in my mind or in my family relationships or in my finances, I feel like I'm dying right now. But, you know, Easter reminds us that the resurrected king can resurrect me. Next slide. You know, I'm praying that for you today, that this can happen in your life in a variety of different ways. But there's a catch, and we see it in this scripture, and I want to talk about the catch, even in this statement. You know, people tell me that... Um, even though I pray, I pray and um, it's not working for me. That same power that you're talking about isn't alive in me. I read my Bible. I've been, I've been to church or I go to church. It's not working for me. Everything's getting worse. The resurrected king can resurrect me. Maybe, just maybe, you've missed the catch. And I want to make sure you know about it. And it's on the screen. Can I have that slide, the resurrected king can resurrect me? Thank you. Awesome. There's a, there's, there's a word there highlighted in gold. And it says he's the risen king. He's the king. He's the king of my life. You know, Jesus is the risen king. And I want to make that case, and I know I don't have a lot of time, and we've already had a great time this morning. Haven't the production team and the food team done an outstanding job? Have you enjoyed this morning? Give them a hand. I don't know if you know this or not, but this was the charge that, was, uh, that Jesus was convicted of. Do you know the charge, the thing that Jesus was convicted of that got him on the cross? I, wa I wonder if you know. Have a little chat. 30 seconds. Go. On your table. What was the charge that Jesus was convicted of that got him on the crucifixion? What do you think it was? Have a chat on your table. All right, I'm going to go to Matthew 27 and I'm going to tell you what it was. It says this in Matthew 27. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the gov governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Jesus stood before this Roman governor and we know him to be Pontius Pilate. 
And he, he Pontius Pilate says, hey, I heard you think, you know, you're the king of the Jews, that you're claiming to be the king of the Jews. Are you? And Jesus says, well, yeah, it's as you say. And I guess, you know, at this moment, from this moment on, this is the charge against Jesus, that he claims to be the king of the Jews. Well, Rome was ruling. There was no other king other than Caesar. And Jesus is saying to the Roman ruler, Pontius Pilate, that I'm the king of the Jews. It is as you say. This is the charge against Jesus. And I love Jesus' answer. He doesn't deny it. But from this moment on, of course, it gets a bit more serious. The next step is he's flogged horrifically. There's not a piece of skin left on his body that isn't broken. He's bleeding. And after they flog him, they take him into a room. We know it to be the praetorium. Have I said that right? The guard's locker room. And in that space, they mock him and they spit him and spit on him and they hit him. And we know this part of the story. They, they make a crown of thorns and they force it onto his brow. And like, I think the thorns were a bit longer than those little rosebush thorns. But I want to point something out to you at this moment that this was not common of crucifixions. They didn't put a crown of thorns on people, everybody that got crucified. This was unique to Jesus because he's of his claim that he was the king of the Jews. Nobody else claimed to be the king of the Jews. Do you know, they, they actually, in that space, in the praetorium, they knelt and they mocked him. And they called him the king of the Jews. Hail the king of the Jews in Matthew 27, verse 29. You know, I, I'm sorry, I know this is a little harsh, but bear with me if you will and if you forgive me. But I think maybe some of us, unknowingly even, we still mock him. Because, you know, we like parts of who Jesus is. We like the forgiving Jesus. We like the gracious Jesus. We like the loving Jesus. We like the humble Jesus. We all love those parts of who Jesus is. But for a lot of people, he's not King Jesus. And they love, you know, for a lot of people, they still don't like being told what to do. Maybe some of us even in this room. Even by God. And that's why some of us, even with, with some Christians, we feel like we have the freedom to be able to adjust the Bible to fit it to how we want to live. In essence, can I tell you today, that's a mockery. We're twisting another crown of thorns and saying mockingly, hail the king of the Jews. They even place this sign on the top of Jesus' cross and probably many of you would be able to tell me what it was. But in Matthew 27 verse 37 it says this, above his head... They place the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And it was written in both all three languages of the common day, Greek, Latin, and Aramaic. And it was this written cha charge, this is what convicted him, that he claimed to be the King of the Jews. The truth is, he is King. Three days later, the day we celebrate today, Three days when he, later, when he got up out of the grave, he proved it, that he is the king, the king of kings. And right now, he is seated in, on the throne of God in heaven. Amen? Amen. You know, the whole story ends with his kingship. And I want to go to the end of the book in Revelations chapter 19 and, and verses 11 to 16. It's only a couple of pages from the end of the book, and it says this, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. It doesn't sound like nice Jesus to me, right there. It says he, he's justice, with justice he judges and wages war. It sounds like a king. Let's go on. It says, his eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. There's a name that no one knows but himself. He is humble. He is gracious. And he is loving and forgiving, but he's also dressed in a robe. 
He's dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Why don't you take three seconds and give him some praise right now? Jesus. He is our king. Whether you say he is or he isn't, he is the king. But the question of the day is, is he yours? Is he your king? I know you might have the other parts of the name of Jesus down pat. The gracious king, the forgiving king, the loving king. And that's really important. They're all important. And I'm not diminishing any of those. We need to know Jesus as our humble, incredible, loving saviour. But he's also the risen king. He's mighty, he's victorious, he's powerful. And I had this thought that for a lot of us, we don't, it's, it's not like we don't want to relate to him as our king, our mighty, powerful king, but we don't truly understand kingship and kingdoms because although we live within the commonwealth and we have a king as our monarch, here in Australia, we don't really live in a kingdom We live in a democracy. Is that right? Yeah. And the preamble, you know, I looked it up this week to our constitution states that Australia is an independent nation. And it's now ruled by the Australian people's decision, which means it begins with us. We the people. It's all about us. And in a democracy, my opinion and my vote actually matters. And that's important. Who likes to be able to have a say? I like that we live in a country where there's freedom to be able to do that. And if we don't like a law, we'll, you know, we, we all advocate together and we rally together and we, you know, we, we call for a referendum and we can rewrite the laws actually if we, if we really want to. We can create a law because we are a self-ruled people. And let me be clear, I, I really love that, that um, I live in Australia. <laughs> I'm so blessed. Are we not blessed to live in Australia? We truly are. But the Bible is not written in a democratic mindset. And I had this thought that sometimes we treat him in this way. And so we begin to bargain with God and we say, oh, let's rewrite that part of the Bible. I don't really like that. And I don't want to ever read that again because that doesn't fit with my internal belief system. And so we pick and choose what we do read and what we like to read. But in a kingdom... His preamble is found, written, gives, we've, got, we've got some context here in the New Testament. It tells us in John, in the beginning was the Word, in Revelations, and the Word was God. In, a biblical, in the kingdom of God, I don't have an opinion or a vote because I'm God ruled. Is this messing with you? And if I'm God ruled, you know, hey, you know, what if that doesn't sound appealing to you, then look at it like this. When you come into God's family, he doesn't call you slaves or servants. This is the good news. If you make him your king, he brings you into his royal family. You get your own crown, the New Testament tells us. The New Testament tells us that he wants to put, put a, new, a crown on you. He gives you a robe of righteousness. He doesn't treat you like a peasant. Not quite there yet, guys. He treats you like a prince and a princess in his royal kingdom. And he gives you the best in everything that he has. But I don't think a lot of us understand him as king. You know, we love his attributes but we don't always like his absolutes. And so the resurrection power of God maybe never worked for us and you've wondered why. Maybe right at the beginning when you said, you know, I try all these things, but it's not working for me. That power isn't at work in my life. And could it be, this is the catch that I was referring to, that it's because our relationship with God isn't clearly defined by all his roles including the fact that he is king. Um, I have this image on the screen. Thank you, guys. 
And this is um, a picture of um, the crown that is worn in the coronation and has been for many, many years, um, for, for many, in, in many coronations. You may have even um, travelled to um, London and been witness to see this. This is um, kept in the um, jewels, in the uh, royal jewels, in the Tower of London. Excuse me. And on this crown is the second biggest cut diamond in all of the world, recorded in all of the world. Um, I don't know if you can see it. It's just at the bottom of the ruby sapphire, the red, big red stone. And underneath that r big red stone is the um, second largest cut diamond in all of the world. It is 317.4 carats. Ooh, that is huge, isn't it? I don't know what you're wearing on your finger, but mine is not that big. <laughs> the first um, biggest diamond, cut diamond, is actually um, on the next image. It's on the scepter that um, King Charles is holding. And it's, it's actually just under, there's a little cross. And then there's the, um, that's, a, that's a huge diamond. Um, I forgot, it's over 530 carats. That's a huge diamond. That's amazing. You know, um, I, I'm saying this for a reason. I'm getting there. You know, they place this crown on the head of someone who is not perfect. Who is just a man or just a woman. And they bow and they sing. And if you watched King Charles' coronation, you would have seen them do all of this not long ago. But here's a thought, and I, and I want you to just think about this. Charles was king from the moment that Queen Elizabeth took her last breath. In that moment, he became king. But he wasn't officially crowned as king until eight months later. He was already king, but he hadn't been crowned. And in Easter 2024, I want to tell you that Jesus is king. He's the risen king. But maybe today you need to crown him the king of your heart. I'm asking you to crown him Lord of all. And he's not king or crowned until you treat him as a kingdom but not a democracy. Remember? It's, it's what he says. The resurrection power of Jesus is activated by our level of submission and devotion to him. This is the summary sentence of everything that I'm saying this morning. I had this thought that we, you know, we have this expectation of God without going to the level of relationship with him that he requires in order for us to receive it. If he's king... And if you don't crown him, guess what? You're the king. And if you try to rule your own life, you'll discover you're not good at it. I don't know about you, but maybe you've had moments where you, you've had come to your senses and you realize, I'm, not, I'm making a mess of this myself. So the whole world right now is trying to blame God and blatantly mocking God's word and God's ways. And you can probably testify, you've probably seen it in your community or even maybe in your family circumstances or in your workplace. The world, it feels like the world's gone insane. The world's lost its mind. There's stuff going on in our world right now that you don't need me to list off. You know because it's happening to you or around you. You know, when, that's what happens when we start running our own life. It's going to lead us to a horrible place. I want, to, I want to just let you know, though, that God, God, it's not God's plan for us because of Jesus to punish you because Jesus took the punishment of our sin. But he does withdraw his presence from us. And who I know, for me, I want to be where God's presence is. I want to be right there in the sweet spot of his presence. And when God's not involved in your life, you're not going to like it because you don't have his protection because he's no longer the king and you're covering so I want to close with this story. I'm talking about Daniel, and you might think that's a weird place to go on Resurrection Sunday. But the story of Daniel 
In the story of Daniel, um, the story of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 5, um, sorry, Daniel chapter 4, there's a story of King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar is a, the king of Babylon, and, um, which is modern-day Iraq. And the people of Israel had been taken into captivity. And it says that they were in captivity there for 70 years. And there was millions of Jews taken into captivity. And they called that time, that season of time, at exile. They were in exile. And Daniel was a young person who was devoted to God and submitted to God. And he wasn't prepared to bow down to the culture that they'd been brought into. And you know, who of you knows that we are all, we have the opportunity to conform to the culture around us and not shine brightly the love and, and, and devotion we have for Jesus Christ. But Daniel was a man who um, stood firm and he stood tall. And um, so it had gotten, the word had gotten around that he was a man who knew God and heard from God and spoke to God. And so in this story in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has a vision and he sees this tree and he knows in the, in the dream that um, he, he's concerned there's something he should be concerned about. Because in his dream, in this vision he has, the tree is cut down to its stump. And he's got this feeling, he knows it's not right. So he calls in all these people, all these, you know, people that, his enchanters and his, you know, people that he, he calls. And, and the thing about Nebuchadnezzar was he, he was a pretty incredible guy. He was an incredible leader. And in history and, and even non-biblical history records that he, he created the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, um, like one of the greatest wonders of the world. And so his empire was vast. But the thing about Nebuchadnezzar was he thought he was all that. That he'd done it. That he was the best king, the greatest king ever. He was in control. And in this moment, he doesn't have the answer. He doesn't know what this dream means. And so someone brings him Daniel. So Daniel, Daniel tells him what he thinks the dream means. And it says this in Daniel chapter 4, verse 5. I'm not going to read all the way to 26. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Daniel came into this place, into the king's court. And um, he said, the king said, and Daniel said, I know exactly what this is all about. It, it means, king, that your, your empire is going to be cut down off of the stumps. And God's going to judge you. And he's going to, it, it goes on to say that seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the most high sovereign over the kingdoms of men. And so uh, Daniel spoke out what he knew God's word was for Nebuchadnezzar at this time. And Nebuchadnezzar was going to go insane. It says that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. And it's recorded in this story that Nebuchadnezzar ignored the warning. That he, he Daniel's, Daniel called him to acknowledge God as the sovereign king, as the, as the ruler of heaven and earth. But da Nebuchadnezzar ignored the warning. And I don't want this for you today. And what happens is that a seven, a, a year later to the day, it's recorded that Nebuchadnezzar goes insane. And he leaves the palace and, and um, scholars can't, scholars, there's conflict around whether it literally, whether he literally ate grass and crawled around on his all fours. But what the point is that he lost his mind because he didn't acknowledge the sovereign King of Heaven as his Lord. You know, and I, when I read this scripture, when I read this story, I think there are so many people who would characterize their situation as insane, as madness, out of control. If only you knew, Joe, the war that is going on in my mind.
Then Daniel said to the king, seven years are going to pass. Unfortunately, God is going to judge you. You're going to spend seven years insane until you acknowledge that the Most High is your sovereign, until you crown Him Lord of all. And the moment that you do, your kingdom will be restored when you do acknowledge that heaven rules. So it goes on to say that at the end of that time, of the seven years of insanity, Nebuchadnezzar raised his eyes toward heaven and his sanity was restored. And this is what I want for you. That if your seven years has been just going on too long, then it can end today. If you're tired of feeling the craziness and the insanity of the world in your mind and in your life, it happens when you crown him king of all. You know, it it ends with this in Daniel chapter 4. Then I praise the Most High. I honoured and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar praised the Most High. He did it. Nebuchadnezzar converted. He became a follower of God. And everything in his kingdom was restored to him. It says in in verse 37, At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honour and splendour were returned to me for the glory of God of my kingdom. God did that and he acknowledged that. You know, in other words, every part of his kingdom came back into order again. And so today, it's a, it can be as simple of the, as that. If your world's, world's in chaos, if there's an insanity to your world, it can be as simple as acknowledging Christ Jesus as your risen king and that he will bring order back into the internal, into your world. resurrected King and He can resurrect you. Do you believe it? He can. He wants to bring dead things to life in you. Now there's, I've just got four responses that I want to bring to you today and if you haven't yet got your communion, I just invite you to come and grab some communion because we're going to finish with that right now. For some of you, you might choose number letter A which says that Jesus is already my king you might say he's already my king but what I know is that all of you are in, in um, one of these categories Some you all fit somewhere here maybe you're in B maybe I need to begin again I'm beginning a real relationship with Jesus as my king or maybe you're C I just want to consider it a bit more. I want to think about this. And last of all, and this one freaks me out a little bit, maybe you're here today and you're saying, I don't ever want to acknowledge Jesus as my King. But I would imagine that that you all fit into one of these categories today. And in this moment, as I've talked about crowning Jesus Christ as King and His power, that great power, that can be at work in you, that we read in Romans chapter 8. His power is at work in us today. He's our resurrected King. That means that the same power lives within me. The same power can bring the dead parts of my life to life. So we're going to remember Jesus' broken body together. And I want to pray for you. If, you, uh, if you're a bee, C or D today, then I just want to pray for you. And you might say, if you're D, I don't ever, I don't, you know, don't pray for me. But listen, you know what? I know that what can happen is in life is when we don't acknowledge Christ as King, our world can get even more insane. And it might take you to rock bottom before you you say, Jesus, I want to make you the King. I want my life to come into order. I want to surrender. I want to be submitted to you. And in that moment, I'm hoping that you'll come back here and we'll be able to celebrate with you and lead you toward a relationship with Jesus that's real and vibrant and powerful. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me right now? God, 
God, I thank you for the people in the room who have a vibrant, alive relationship with you. I thank you, God, that, that they know that you are their king and that, that you are real. God, I thank you for the people in the room who want to begin again that relationship with you, who are choosing today to say, I want to crown you as the king of my life. I want to crown you. I want to submit my life to you. I want to have that level of power flowing through me. I want to know you more, God. I pray for those people, for the people who are considering, who are thinking about it. Holy Spirit, God, I just pray that you would reveal yourself to them, that, that, that they would see you as the risen King. And for those in this room today who are saying, I don't think I'll ever do that, doubt it. I don't think so. Lord, I pray that you would call them and draw them to yourself. That they would know that this is a safe place. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to remember Jesus. I invite you to eat and drink. Jesus.